and the Master Gardener members joining me are Kate and Jamie Hewitt and Christina Wenks. Our program is divided into three parts. Long topic. Next, details on two different yards soon, if not now. And finally, we'll answer your lawn questions. It's Kate Dando, and I wanted to talk to you about ways to get rid of your wet yard. Wet yards can not only be a nuisance, but can kill your lawn and plantings, invite pests, and even damage your house. Virginia gets lots of rain, and if water remains on your lawn for several days, that can be a problem. How do we get rid of it, though? I'm going to introduce you to several techniques to address the problem of wet yards today. Much of the information I'm going to discuss can be found at the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District website at fairfaxcounty.gov. One possibility is that your lawn does not drain well or has poor infiltration. You can check this by conducting a percolation or perk test. So how do you do that? First, dig a hole about one foot by one foot and fill it with water. It should drain completely within 12 hours. If it drains more slowly, you will need to improve your soil drainage. Our clay soils can become compacted by heavy use, and often the topsoil is removed during construction and is never replaced, leaving homeowners with subsoils that have poor drainage. Soil drainage and fertility can be improved through core aeration and the addition of organic materials such as compost. You can core aerate your lawn yourself by renting a core aerator for a small fee from the local big box stores, but it is a fairly heavy and cumbersome machine, so you may want to hire a landscape company to aerate for you. They often charge about $100 for an average lawn. For smaller lawns, there are tools that will allow you to pull out plugs manually without too much effort. Adding in organic material is one of the best ways to improve your soil's drainage and fertility. Organic material improves your soil's ability to accept and store water. Examples include compost, leaf mulch, and well-aged manure. Adding organic material to the lawn in a thin layer, about a quarter of an inch, and use the back of a rake to spread it evenly. Grass clippings can also be left on the lawn throughout the year to help improve soil composition. Some lawns may also have low spots or depressions that collect water. This is a problem that George asked us to address during registration. If the depressions are shallow, they can be corrected by adding soil and regrading the lawn so that the water flows more easily across the surface. Try not to add more than half an inch of soil as any deeper and the grass may be smothered. If the depression is deeper, you may have to remove the turf first and fill it in with soil, tamp it into place, and then replace the turf. Another option would be to regrade and then reseed. Reseeding is most successful when done in the fall, although it is okay to do it in the spring as well. You may have to pay more attention to watering during the summer if you reseed in the spring. It is often too dry and hot for reseeding to be successful during the summer, but it might work well enough to hold the soil in place until the fall when you can do it again. For many homeowners though, there's just too much water coming onto their lawn and it has no place to go. So what do we do then? The solution is to drying out your lawn centers on redirecting the water, slowing it down, and then finding a way to absorb it. Choose the area that is important for you to keep dry, usually the backyard lawn where the family gathers, and then create other areas to manage the water. The first step is to identify where the water is coming from. Take a moment when it is raining to watch how the water flows into and through your property. Next, you need to figure out where you would rather have it go. The more water you have coming onto your property and the steeper the slope you're dealing with, the more intensive it will be to redirect and manage the water. Swales are a great way to redirect water away from the lawn. They're usually wide and shallow and planted with grass. You often see them along the side of the road in housing developments that don't have sidewalks. Grass is an inexpensive way to hold the soil in these swales, but it can be a challenge to mow on the side of a swale and grass can have a hard time growing at the bottom of the swale. Another option is to fill the swale with gravel and rocks, and it is often then called a dry riverbed. You can also plant these swales with native plants that thrive in wet lowlands. They are often called bioswales and do an excellent job of slowing and absorbing the water from your property. They're also wonderful at filtering the water 
and improving water quality before it reaches larger bodies of water. They're also quite beautiful and are a great source of food for pollinators. Native plants are best in these wet and difficult positions as they are most adapted to our climate and will require the least maintenance. You can find a list of native plants that can handle the alternating flooding and drying cycles of a water catchment area in Appendix B in Rain Garden Design and Construction for Homeowners on the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District website. French drains can also be an effective um, in redirecting a stronger flow of water or managing water flow in a smaller area. French drains are trenches that are usually about a foot wide and a foot and a half deep, lined with landscape fabric and then filled with gravel around a perforated tube or pipe, which is often called a drain tile. There are also products on the market like Easy Drain that simplify this process for the DIY homeowner by combining the landscape fabric, drainage media, and perforated pipe into one unit. Remember to keep a slight grade to the pipe when installing it to keep the water flowing. Channel drains are great at moving large amounts of water quickly, but do nothing to slow down or absorb the water. They merely move the water to another more suitable location. Channel drains are particularly well suited to redirecting water from hardscapes. Many people in Fairfax County have steep driveways that slope towards the house and the front lawn. Installing French drains across the driveway can really help in this situation. The slope of the drain is very important here to keep in mind as is creating an area at the end of the drain that can manage the water. Berms are another way to, re to redirect water. A berm is really nothing more than mounded soil, which is usually planted or lined with rocks to keep the soil from eroding. Levees found along riverbanks are, in essence, very large and well-constructed berms. Berms can be very attractive in the landscape and can direct water away from the area you are trying to keep dry. By their very nature, they create a channel that the water will follow. By creating a swale alongside the berm, you can increase the amount of water that can be redirected. In my yard, for example, the edge of the lawn where it meets the patio forms a small berm that directs even the heaviest downpour past my foundation and away from my lawn. Walls are very effective at redirecting water and are perfect for controlling runoff and erosion on slopes and hillsides. There are numerous products on the market that make it easy for homeowners to build small walls. Since the soil that the wall holds back can get quite heavy, it is recommended that homeowners hire a professional for walls over four feet. An option for the DIY homeowner, though, would be to build a series of lower walls. For all but the shortest walls, drainage needs to be built in behind the wall. Usually you would install a French drain just behind the wall. This reduces the pressure, keeps water from seeping through during heavy rainstorms, and effectively moves the water to the ends of the wall. Another problem that people have is the large amount of water coming from their downspouts. It is important to make sure that the water flows away from the foundation. Most people have the splash block at, block at the bottom of their downspout, but often that is not enough and people still have puddles in their lawn and water pooling near the foundation of their house. So is there anything better you can do? You can add rain barrels to your downspouts. Rain barrels can reduce the amount of water flowing into your yard during a rainstorm. You can then either use that water for watering your garden or just release it later when the lawn is drier and can absorb it better. Rain barrels can be attractive enough for your front lawn or can be linked together to create a substantial reservoir. A typical rain barrel holds about 50 gallons. If you want a rain barrel system large enough to capture all the water off your roof, you would need about six rain barrels to capture the water coming off of a 500 square foot roof from an inch of rain. But remember, even if you don't have the space or desire for a system large enough to capture all the water from one of our big rainstorms, you will still see an improvement by using at least a few rain barrels. Either with or without a rain barrel, it is a good idea to ensure that water from your downspouts is directed at least four feet away from your foundation. We recommend that you control the water from your downspout with one or more of the techniques I've just discussed. For example, you can direct the water into a dry riverbed that moves it away from your foundation and lawn. If you have a hard surface such as a driveway or walkway, you could install a channel drain through that surface or possibly a French drain under it. 
The water could then be sent to an area of your property, which is planted with trees and shrubs, which do a great job of absorbing water, or into a bioswale or rain garden. Rain gardens are probably one of my favorite ways to capture excess water on your property. Water from hillsides and downspouts can be directed to most any downhill location on your property. A rain garden should be down and away from your foundation, and you should check the percolation or infiltration rate of the area where you plan to site a rain garden. In the case of a rain garden, water should drain from the hole within 48 hours. Many people worry about insects when they see a rain gar garden or other catchment filled with water after a rain. However, this is exactly what they're designed to do. As long as the rain garden drains within two to three days, insect eggs will not have time to hatch. Ideally, the rain garden is sized to accommodate the amount of water coming off your roof and other hard surfaces, but once again, any steps you take will be helpful. So even a small rain garden will help dry out your lawn, improve water quality, reduce the impact of stormwater on the county's streams and rivers, and provide food for pollinators. They're also beautiful to boot. To build a rain garden, you should remove the soil down about 12 inches, although it can be deeper or more shallow. The soil at the bottom of the rain garden would then be amended with about 50% sand and compost to improve drainage. It is also a good idea to add an underdrain in the rain garden to handle overflow from the largest storms. Easy to follow instructions are in the rain garden design and construction manual that you can find on the Fairfax County Soil and Water Conservation website that I mentioned earlier. I highly recommend taking a look at all the information and programs that this website has to offer. Could you go to the next slide, please? In addition to the manual on rain gardens and the native plants that thrive in them and other wet sites, there is detailed information um, with diagrams on all the techniques I outlined in my talk. You can find the rain garden manual under the technical information and services, as well as several other manuals covering drainage and erosion, pasture management, green infrastructure, stream and water quality management. There's also a link to the county soil map where you can look up the information about the soil on your specific piece of property. There's also a manual entitled You and Your Land. This is another great resource. It has information on our region and how we can manage our property most effectively, including how to plan a landscape, how to manage wetlands, pastures and slopes, as well as how to keep pests out of your yard and your garden. The section entitled Hands-On Conservation has information on several great programs that Fairfax County offers. Here you can find information on workshops to build your own rain barrel or composter, also about volunteer opportunities if you want to get involved in protecting Virginia's waterways. Here you can find out about Fairfax County's yearly native seedling sale. Seedling sale. Every year you can purchase about eight tree and shrub seedlings for less than $20. They may be small when you get them, but on the plus side, that makes them super easy to plant. And it won't be long before they really take hold and thrive in your yard. There is also a sustainable garden tour every year. You should really take a look at the link to the tour for 2020 as all the tours were virtual and, avail and are still available for you to view online. You can find a lot of great ideas for your own yard here. Most interesting to homeowners perhaps is the Virginia Conservation Assistance Program, also known as VCAP. Fairfax County provides small grants to help homeowners and community groups develop projects that manage water effectively in an environmentally friendly way. There are lots of projects that Fairfax County can help you with, including building rain gardens and bioswales, adding rain barrels and planting native plants for water management and wildlife. The assistance program provides funds to help pro fund these projects for homeowners and applications will open up this summer. You can sign up to be notified when applications are open on this same website. I hope that you find some of this information on managing water on your property helpful. Does anybody have any questions for me at this time? No questions at this time, Kate. Great, Kate, thank, you. thank you very much. So next we have Jamie with annual bluegrass. You're on mute, Jamie. Okay. Sorry about that. There we go. Uh, I'm going to speak to you today about the grassy weed annual bluegrass. 
and its Latin name is Poa Anua, and it's in the family, which most grasses are in, of Poa Aceae. Annual bluegrass is a common weed in the lawn, turf, grass, and gardens that grows best in cool, moist conditions in full sun to partial shade and is intolerant to draft and high temperatures. This weed is non-native to North America. It originally came from Europe, but is found worldwide on every continent, even Antarctica. Annual bluegrass is a true annual. That means its seeds germinate in the late fall, summer, fall, even winter, when the temperature drops below 75 degrees Fahrenheit. It produces seeds from the flowers in the spring and it dies in the heat of the summer. It is a prolific seed producer as each plant produces several hundred seeds in a season that can lay dormant for years before sprouting. The seeds, so in the photo here, the seed heads are white with open panicles uh, with a pyramid shape on short stalks with each individual little spikelet in the panicle and each of those spikelets produces somewhere between two and six flowers and seeds. This slide shows some specific features of the grass itself, um, which is a member of this grass family. The leaves are light green and hairless with a pronounced mid vein, which makes the leaf appear creased. Uh, and it has the, a tip that is shaped like a boat. This is characteristic of the uh, genus Poea. And if you look closely at the leaf, it has two indented valleys on each side of the mid vein, which is referred to as railroad tracks. A mature leaf is less than five millimeters in width, and the leaves have wavy margins near the base of the stalk. The leaf arrangement is folded in the bud and is V-shaped. And the legule, which is that membrous, thin membrous sheath you see there at the base of the leaf, that is pointed, and as I said, it's, it's, a mem it's membrane, it's membranous looking. The weed does not have an oracle, which other grasses do, and it, which is a little small ear-like projection at the base of the leaf. These features of annual bluegrass distinguish it from grass, other grasses, such as Kentucky bluegrass, which is regular turf grass. But as you can see from this photo on a macro scale, this weed grows in erect clumps and its light green color can be distinguished for in your turf by these lighter looking patches if you look down on it. Now, when you hand pull or dig the clumps out, of the soil, you'll see that the clumps have fibrous, shallow roots, and this weed does not produce rhizomes or stolons. The conditions that favor its growth is cool, moist conditions, as I said earlier, compacted soil, close mowing, mean, meaning less than three inches high, and high uh, levels of nitrogen fertilizer as well as phosphorus fertilizers, which this latter fertilizer can promote survival of germinating annual bluegrass seedlings. And we certainly don't wanna do that. Now there are a number of methods and treatments that you can try to control annual bluegrass, some with more success than others, but this is a very difficult weed to eradicate once you have it. The first thing you should do is you should try cultural methods such as hand pulling, digging, hoeing, to remove the annual bluegrass before it produces these seeds. This may be successful when you have an early infestation or you have a very small area that you're working with, but you must continue to monitor it and continue to remove any new growth for months. These methods should include the, the cultural methods should include good sanitation methods, which uh, what I mean by that is that you should clean your tools and clean your mower blades and dispose of these weeds so in a closed container so that you don't spread them. For example, you wouldn't put them in your composter. <laughs> if your soil is compacted, you can aerate your soil with a lawn aerator 
And this should be done in early summer once your lawn has gotten a chance to become fully green and established. And you want to make sure that your lawn has recovered before these grass seeds germinate. It is important to irrigate your lawn properly. And what I mean by that is that you should uh, irrigate in the morning and uh, at the times of low rainfall. And you should water your lawn deeply, but infrequently. And what this does is it, is, it encourages your turf grass to develop deeper roots to go down for the water that has moved through your soil. And it's a disadvantage to, these, uh, to the annual bluegrass because they have these shallow roots. Another thing you can do is you can mow your grass to the proper height, which is three inches in the spring and three and a half inches in the summer and fall, because that encourages turf growth and not weed growth. The other thing you can do and, and is Generally, you do return. We, you sh it's good to put your glass, grass clippings back onto your soil because it provides a lot of nutri nitrogen excuse me, to your turf grass. But in this time when you're trying to get rid of the, um, the, blue, the annual bluegrass, you should bag it. So this is one exception to that because if you spread it around, it would, you'd spread it all over your grass. Now, of course, the other thing you can do, and which seems to be m fairly effective, <laughs> it is effective, is uh, chemical control. So the first thing you should always do is make sure that you follow the, the use of the on the label of these products. Make sure that it's for the, the weed you want, this weed that you want to treat, and please use it according to the label. The best treatment of annual bluegrass is the use of pre-emergent herbicides. And these products should be applied in uh, late summer, early fall, uh, when the temperature drops below 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, some of these uh, products are uh, listed here on this slide, but I refer you to a reference that I have at the end, which is the Virginia Cooperative Extension Pest Management Guide, particularly table 5.5 on these pages, 518 and 519. Uh, and it will provide information to you. The one thing uh, I should say is that uh, you should not seed, put down new seed uh, as been discussed by Kate. Generally you sow new grass seed down in the fall. That's the best time to, to put it down, but you shouldn't put it down with pre-emergence because the pre-emergence uh, inhibit both the grass seed and the weed seed. Now. There are some new herbicide products that um, are uh, available that claim that they can be used at the time of seeding or right after that for most grass types. But this type of product is not recommended at this time uh, by us because um, uh, the, the, uh, the pest management guide uh, does not recommend doing both at the same time. So until we know a bit more and there's more definitive data, um, we wouldn't suggest that you use these products. You can also use post-emergence. So once you have it, now what do you do? So post-emergence can be applied, but none of these products are selective for annual bluegrass and non-selective post-emergent herbicides can be used for spot treatments, but you have to take care that you don't damage your turf grass or other plants because it could damage them as well as uh, uh, kill the weed. So I think the basic message to homeowners to get rid of annual bluegrass is that once you have this weed, it's, it's difficult to control. So know that going in. Um, one thing you can do is you can, if you have it, you can improve the turf uniformity by mowing it to reduce the seed heads and to maintain your grass height. Uh, the best control is to maintain a healthy, dense turf that will compete with and prevent the weed from getting a foothold. Uh, and of course, pre-emergence. Remember, it's a true annual. It will die in the summer heat, but um, uh, but beca because it is such a prolific seed producer, it cannot be eradicated and it can probably only be managed. And one, it, once it does die in the summer, it could leave behind brown spots 
and bare spots in your lawn. Um, and the next slide is my uh, list of references and it gives the pest management guide. That's the second reference where there's specific information. Um, so um, uh, does anybody have any questions at this time? No, there is no, uh, no questions for you, Jamie. There's another question that we can perhaps come back to at the end, uh, okay. which doesn't directly relate to, to annual bluegrass. And I've just posted your links into the chat box for those who would like to pick up some of those links and, and get to them earlier. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Jamie. That was great. Um, fantastic presentation. Uh, Christina, uh, you're up next with Broadleaf Plantains. Thanks. I'm Christina Tyler Winks, and I'm talking about another aggressive weed you are likely to find in your garden. Broadleaf plantain is a very common weed found in turf grasses. It's known by many names, such as Plantago major, snakeweed, plantain, and a number of other names. Um, broadleaf plantain is often found in turf grasses. You'll see it in nurseries, landscapes, because it can tolerate a variety of conditions even low mowing heights. Broadleaf plantain germinates from seed in spring all the way through summer and occasionally into fall, depending on the temperature and moisture of your lawn space. Broadleaf plantain is a perennial, which means the plant comes back year after year and it just has more opportunity to create seed. It is a prolific seeder. It produces flowers from June to about September on long leafless stalks, flower stalks, but without the flowering portion, or at least what looks like a flower to most of us. Those stalks are a light green or whitish growth that comes out of the center of a leafy rosette. The seeds are produced in an oval shaped capsule and each of those capsules contain up to 30 viable seeds. Each of those stalks contains a lot of seed capsules. So according to Ohio State University's Agricultural Research and Development Center, each broadleaf plantain plant can produce up to 14,000 seeds per year. And to me, <laughs> this gardener, what remains, what is scary is that those seeds remain viable without sprouting for up to 60 years. So again, this is a, an aggressive weed and it can be difficult to control. So let's learn how to identify this plant and how to control it if necessary. The leaves are elliptical, elliptical to oval shaped with a, a leafy edge that might be wavy, but it's rarely toothed along the edges. Leaves are arranged in a rosette pattern, and the first two leaves that emerge from the seed, or the cotyledons, emerge as spatula-shaped leaves that are covered in a powder-like coating. This is what makes them easy to identify when they're very small. Those first few young leaves have three parallel veins. The subsequent leaves are oval, with three to five deep veins and develop into a basal rosette that can grow flat in turf grasses as well as canopy erect and over your turf grass. So depending on the mowing pattern, if any, the broadleaf plantain can continue to be a survivor, thriver, and overseeder. Um, the full leaf size is about six inches long and about four inches wide. So you can definitely distinguish this from the rest of your lawn. The oval and egg-shaped leaves abruptly narrow down to the stalk where they connect. Depending on the size of the broadleaf plantain, the leaves can even appear hairy. So at this time of spring, you might not see the hair on the leaves, but heading into midsummer, definitely into fall, um, they can cast a hairy appearance. I've actually confused them with some other plants when they started to sprout nearby. Um, the profile of the plant is a leafless flower stalk that appears very spiky out of the center and it towers over the rest of the plant. And the roots have a somewhat shallow taproot, but a lot of stu short, stubby, fibrous roots that really enjoy rich, moist soils that, soils that are particularly rich in calcium. Um, cool temperatures can make young, broadleaf plantain plants appear purplish 
Uh, but broadleaf plantains are opportunistic growers, opportunistic feeders, and they can tolerate a lot of poor soil too, many conditions. So let's learn how to control them. First, we remove plantain seedlings and the more mature plants that we find before they produce seeds. Monitor the area for several months to be sure that the plantains do not re-sprout. Controlling the mature plantain plants is difficult uh, when you're only relying on hand pulling, digging, or hoeing because of their persistent crowns. The mowing methods are not an effective control, like mowing close to the ground, mowing low, because the leaves can also lie close to the ground. So it will adapt to whatever it's given. Repeated removal of plants for several months is the most successful in a home garden or lawn. And to remove the spread of the plantain and other weeds, do clean your equipment prior to use in a new area. The seeds are super small, they stick to a lot of your equipment and you don't want to broadcast the seeds inadvertently. According to the University of California, no single method is truly successful in controlling the broadleaf plantain and turf grass. So you have to apply many methods. Early removal of the new seedlings is, is successful when practiced diligently. Digging out the perennial plantain plants must be done for several years to be successful though. Once the weeds are eradicated, the areas should be renovated and managed to establish a healthy turf grass that can help eliminate the growth of these bigger broadleaf weeds. Pre-emergent herbicides that limit the germination of plantain and turf grass contain active ingredients such as atrazine, indazoflam, isoxabin, and mesotrione. Repeated applications of post-emergent broadleaf herbicides can control plantain seedlings. However, controlling mature plants with herbicides is difficult. So products that contain 2,4-D work best. Additional post-emergence herbicides options include bromoxanil, carfebtrazone, dicamba, mesotrione, and penoxalum, as well as sulfentrazone. Quinclorac provides some fair control of buckthorn plantain, but it doesn't provide much control for the broadleaf plantain. Um, Clopyrrolid herbicides require the highest label rate for broadleaf plantain control, but frankly, it's the combinations of active ingredients that lead to improved control of broadleaf plantain. The best post-emergent control is achieved from a fall herbicide application, and repeat applications might be needed to kill the weakened perennial plants, because perennial, and any new, new uh, germinating seedlings as well. And of course, we say very often as master gardeners, um, and this is very, very important, as with any herbicide or pesticide, use only as labeled. For more information about broadleaf plantain, you can search turf grass sciences at Purdue University, as well as at the Ohio State University's Agriculture Research and Development Center as well as the agriculture and natural resources at the University of California. They've each done extensive research on broadleaf plantain and other aggressive broadleaf weeds. Virginia Tech has information on controlling weeds within turf grasses. Um, and for more about the chemical control, use the resources that we've mentioned previously. Jamie and Kate um, mentioned the Cooperative Extension Pest Management Guide. Virginia Tech and the Cooperative Extension um, are a great resource there. So broadleaf plantain, um, I have been able to successfully eradicate it from some parts of my own garden, but there are parts of my lawn, because as Kate mentioned with uh, damp, shady spaces, I think I've tried every one of her methods of water control and water movement. Um, but there are some areas where I've just let the broadleaf plantain go for now, because at this point it becomes an, a means of erosion control, particularly as it uh, backs up into an RPA and a restricted protection area and space that needs to absorb the water. 
um, as try, I'm avoiding using the chemicals as a result and only manually trying to eradicate. But it's a very difficult uh, weed to control. I've also left in some of that bluegrass that Jamie mentioned. <laughs> Christina, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. And along with Kate and Jamie, what, uh, what wonderful information. Simon, do we have any questions that we need to go through at this point? Um, there was one question that came in, which is a uh, not completely on topic, but maybe we could put it to the team. Jenny has partly answered it. Um, Elizabeth, who has now had to leave us because she had other commitments, was asking about the best way to incorporate compost into the soil without disturbing the grass that's already there. And I think Jenny gave a great answer uh, back to that about coring the lawn so they can actually get the compost going down into the into the core holes. Mm -hmm. And then she sent me a separate, just, just to me, a separate question. She says she understands about core aeration, but she's curious about top dressing. She says right now her backyard is a slab of clay with tufts of grass, mm -hmm. and I'd like to help the soil in between. Um, so she's going to come back on and <clears throat> listen to the, uh, to the uploaded uh, YouTube video. So I don't know if anybody can help uh, Christy, uh, sorry, Elizabeth on, on that particular question. So I may be able to, Simon. Uh, Thanks, I, I use uh, top dressing on my soil all the time because I, I have that compressed uh, clay soil that I only get plantains and bluegrass in it. So uh, when I, over the years, over about three or four years, I've done top dressing and that has created an organic environment where I don't have to fertilize as much actually. I just um, have treated the soil such that it's now regurgitating itself and recasting itself. And uh, I, I, I love top dressing. I, th I think it's a great thing. Oh, great, thanks for that. And hopefully Elizabeth will get that, that answer when she gets uh, to see the, the YouTube video. Uh, this didn't really come up, but I think it's a question that a lot of people have about pre-emergence. Um, so if I put pre-emergent down in late March, uh, do I need to do it again? And if I haven't done it yet, is it too late to do it? So I'm wondering if the team could perhaps answer that. And then also uh, a third related question on pre-emergence. Um, the difference between spring and fall, is it the same? Does it matter uh, whether we do it in spring or fall? Do we get the same results? So it's just a couple, three questions on pre-emergence for the team. So I would say that if you put it down, most pre-emergence are not uh, effective after 60 days. So if you've, depending on when you've put your first one down, it's cer you certainly can put a second one down. You could put the, and you can put the same one down uh, just to keep, them at bay, keep the weeds at bay. And then the second question was, oh, should you do it in the spring and the fall? I, I would say yes. I mean, I think it's the same uh, principle that um, it, it's only effective for so long. So you should, you should put, uh, put it down again in the fall. And then the question, is it too late to put it down now if I haven't put down a pre-emergent? No, not too late at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, uh, there was another question that, that Jenny has also answered, but just to throw it out to the team, because I think it's an interesting one. So what is the best, uh, what, what do you recommend as a, as a top dressing uh, to put on, onto your lawns? What's best to use? Jim, I don't know whether you've got any thoughts on that. Um, Jenny's given an answer in the text box, but... Uh, yeah, I use, a, thoughts? I use a mixture of... Uh, composted manure and uh, uh, leaf, composted leaf, so organic leaf. So the mixture of those two in about a 50-50 ratio has been the best for me. Oh, that's great. And, and Kate has just added, just added to that. Thanks so much, Kate, uh, saying top dressing can be done with compost leaf mulch and village manure. Um, <laughs> I have a question, actually. I, uh, I, I started composting last June, and I have gotten some nice uh, 
soil, but it's very thick. It's not fine. Like the, the, the stuff you get out of the bags is very fine to spread around. So does anybody think I can put that, my composted stuff on, on the, uh, sort of in globs now. I was going to spread it out and try to dry it out a bit. But can you put your own homemade or uh, compost down or would you only put that in your plant beds? Anybody? <laughs> I use it every year. Yeah. Yeah. But do you use it on your lawn? Scraps, I do put it on my lawn. Uh, we've had so much erosion and having to take out some trees with heartwood disease recently and now having to re-landscape so that it does not erode. Uh, the only way I could really make that clay, thick, hard soil viable was to aerate and put down my compost. I finally felt like my compost was really making a difference. I didn't see it in other spaces in my lawn, but this year as a result of this huge project, it's been, I have grass where I've never had grass in 10 years. I'm thrilled, <laughs> but um, I, I have not actually mixed the manure in it. Uh, not, you know, because of smells or, you know, because of neighbors, um, it wouldn't have that kind of smell. It's just the compost that I was making just happened to be only uh, what I was using in my kitchen um, because in some places in my yard, I really need a calcium, I add eggshells and I break them up as I put them into the compost bin. And of course I have a lot of shredded leaves that go in in different times of the year. And I try to keep the seeds out. That is key. So, um, but you have to keep your, your compost at that right mixture, right? Um, mm -hmm. But it does get clumpy. And when I, I've spread it out, I give it a couple of hours. I usually spread it in the morning so that the sun can hit it. And within, you know, the time it takes me to spread it out, I go back to where I started and it's already dry and then I can rake it out and it's no longer clumpy. Um, but I am really loving the, the results. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, thanks everybody for attending. Any more questions, Sarah Simon? No, there's no, no more questions, but maybe I could just finish on the, on the issue of cicadas. I know a lot of people are interested in cicadas, even though that's not our talk today, but just, uh, just a, an unpaid advertisement that the, we're having a virtual plant clinic with Master Gardeners tomorrow uh, at 12.30 to 1.30, April 29th. Uh, and anybody that um, would like to, we'd strongly advise you to, to tune in. It's called, it's called Getting Ready for Cicadas. And I know it's a topic that's on a lot of people's minds. So just a, a bit of an unpaid advertisement for tomorrow's Master Gardener event. Thank you.